We're in the middle of a vast ecological emergency. These are shocking times. I don't think we should underplay them. You know, it's your death. It's the death of your children. That's it, right? You know, it's something to start getting hysterical about, cry all night about. This is it. What's happening in the Arctic is truly terrifying. Last year in the Arctic, temperatures were 20 degrees above normal. There were wildfires burning out of control in the Arctic. I mean, think about that. Wildfires in the Arctic burning out of control. It's beyond urgent. 75% of the volume of ice in the Arctic has already melted in the last 30 years and it's going to approach zero in the next two or three years, maybe the next five years, maybe it be this year. There's enormous amounts of methane under the Arctic, and if that gets released, then we're talking runaway, catastrophic climate change during the 21st century, which will simply extinguish human civilization. 17 of the last 18 summers have been the hottest on record and we know that across the northern hemisphere we have had harvest failure that looks at something like between 20 and 30 percent. The accumulated effects, we have two more hot summers the way we've had them. What scale of harvest failure are we looking at? As a general rule, uh, if the world goes over four degrees above the pre-industrial period, it will no longer be possible to grow grains and corn at scale reliably and grains and corn are the basis of any civilization's food supply. We're looking at starvation in our country across the northern hemisphere in Europe and that's shocking. Most civilizations are what are called complex systems so they're quite resilient until they have a major shock and then they collapse massively in a very short period of time, maybe a week or a month. Uh, and that's probably what will happen with the food supply. On top of that, we know that where you have food collapse, you will have near-term systems collapse. All the other systems rely on our food system. Health and education would collapse. Our financial systems would collapse first, probably. And so life as we know it could not continue. It would also involve, I think, brutality that we can't even imagine. You know, if our neighbours are hungry and if the villages surrounding my village are hungry, what does that bring out for people? The reality is, is that that could quite possibly be our future. You may have heard that last autumn the UN released a report, the 1.5 degree report, in which they said we need to hold the world's overheating to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. If we don't, then civilizational collapse is likely to begin around 2030. We have a 1% chance of hitting 1.5 degrees of global warming. And what's much more likely is that we, we, sit, we, will, we will see global warming within this century between 3 and 5 degrees which creates an inhospitable Earth. If we get to five degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, then we're looking at only a billion people being left on the planet. <coughs> so that means the death of six billion people in the next 30 to 50 years. You might be thinking, well, surely this civilization's been going a long time and it's very strong and it has all sorts of resources. Surely it's gonna find some way through this. But you know, I bet you that's exactly what people thought in the Mayan civilization before they collapsed. It's not going to be too long until it comes for everybody. And I really hope that panics people. Because this is coming for me, and it's coming for you, and it's coming for all of us. And if we don't do something about it, then the world as we know it, the world that props up your companies and delivers for your businesses is not going to exist. I think uh, the time frames that I look at are in terms of my young, the lives of my youngest child, who's eight. These events will unfold before my eight-year-old reaches her adulthood. And, and that, as a mum, um, is terrifying, you know, that, that will I be able to, f this is where I, I can feel my emotions rising, will I be able to feed 
my children, my, my, my Miriam, you know, will, will I be able to keep her safe and warm and well? Should I be stocking up on penicillin? Should, you know, what should I be doing? And what should you be doing? And what can we do together so that our children have a future? They, they don't, they, they, we haven't brought them into this world to suffer horror. Um, that's really present for me in terms of time frames. Sorry. I want to tell you about something which everyone is terrified of. You get some pain in your body or a lump in your body and the doctor comes in and says, you know, I'm very sorry, but you've got cancer and you've got six months to live. Only an idiot would say to the doctor, like, you're wrong and I'm not taking any notice. But that's what we're doing with the whole climate crisis, is people ignore it or they get angry with the messenger. So it's really a matter of biology and physics. That's what we're looking at. It's not a political thing. It's like you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that raises the temperatures and creates chaotic weather and it does it extremely rapidly and we've been doing it for 200 years so we've got a choice you know do we stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and try and avoid a complete collapse or, or don't or don't we and and that's that's basically the question for our generation this is not about 2100 this is not even about future generations anymore this is about us and whether we get to have a future. The problem people have is, is there's this delusion that there's an option called do nothing, right? There isn't, we can't step out of time and space. We can't go, well, we don't like all these options, so we're not doing anything. Doing nothing is an, just another option that's going to lead to the destruction of the next generation. The evidence of the last 30 years shows that carbon emissions have gone up by 60%. So despite endless, endless information reports and lobbying and all the rest of it. I've been involved in the climate change movement since 1991. I specialise in climate change law and I've been very active in the climate change negotiations, including the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol and then the Paris Agreement. I'm a trustee of Greenpeace UK. I work closely with WWF. and part of the insider climate change environment movement that's been um, working you know, really, really hard for 30 years, but I'm afraid the sort of traditional methods of campaigning that we've been using haven't, haven't kind of delivered that sense of uh, urgency yet. We've gone too slow, and in some cases we're going backwards uh, because countries are reneging on those laws or not fulfilling them. The system isn't just listening to petitions or um, sending in letters, you know, the time for that is also um, over. What's needed now is a very rapid, fast, uh, transition to a completely different uh, way of doing uh, economics and a completely different way of living and we need people to see that. You can't sort this one out by being the world's best recycler or taking shorter showers. We've got to do this together, we've got to change the political system together, we've got to do it in this country and then around the world. And that's why I think we need Extinction Rebellion, um, the rebellion is needed. We need to act now. Actually, we needed to act yesterday, but yesterday's gone. We're here now, and thank God, Extinction Rebellion is happening. So what Extinction Rebellion is, is doing is creating disruption in society so that people start attending to the issue, because people won't attend to the issue unless their lives are disrupted. In the, in the same way as when you've got cancer, if you're not in pain, then a lot of people just ignore it. It's time to level with people. And what I'm finding is that people, when they get to hear the truth, when they see someone being honest enough to admit just how bad things are and just how desperate the situation is and therefore just how free we are to break with convention and do something new and something incredible, they find it liberating. It's a bit like a baby falls over a bridge into a river, right? You've got two options. You can stay on the bridge or you can jump in after it. Jumping in after the baby is not going to guarantee you're going to save the baby but it maximises the chances you're going to save the baby, or you can stay on the bridge and sort of argue over the options, right? In which case, the baby's definitely going to die. That's what, you know, adults and parents need to consider. You can run from this problem, but it's not going, not going away.
because it's physics and biology and you have a, a responsibility and an obligation to your children and to the next generation to deal with the problem as is appropriate and the appropriate way to deal with it is to go into rebellion against the, a government that is going to facilitate the death of the next generation. One of the successes of Extinction Rebellion has been that we tell the truth and we're not alarmist and we don't exaggerate but we are prepared to tell people the severity and scale of the crisis which for too long organisations and politicians have been afraid to say. Societies don't fundamentally change without mass disruption. If you want to transform the economy in a decade you're going to have to transform the political system and the fastest way to transform the political system is mass participation civil disobedience which means thousands and hundreds of thousands of people breaking the law to force the government to act and that's why Extinction Rebellion is doing mass direct action right because that will create the emotional arousal for people to actually realize that everything's fucked you know in a visceral you know out of your head mad you know nervous breakdown sort of way. The people that control society control the economy and the way to get them to change is to disrupt the economy because that affects their profits and affects their economic power. So this might sound quite radical but everyone knows like it's fairly basic and it's done a lot and it's called the labour strike. So everyone knows like you know the most effective way to get employers to give you a pay rise is people go and strike. Whether you agree with it or not, it's another matter. But you can't deny it's an effective strategy because it's been used for you know 150 years. Except in this case, you're not just looking at a single employer. You're basically looking at the elites of a country or economy. Everyone's probably heard of Tahrir Square. Uh, it happened in the Philippines, in Burma. It's happened in many, many countries where the population has decided that they've had enough and something that's fundamentally important isn't happening and they're going to take mass that action. I really feel the time to take urgent action is now and that the best thing I could do was to be out there demanding radical change and to say that I was willing to be arrested and to go to prison. Um, I think that that's a far more valuable thing to to sign up to than to say I will spend another year writing a book or an article. We've got all the solutions in place but they're not being acted on. What's important is to go out in the street and make that public statement because that public statement we can guarantee will have a massive effect upon the political culture of the country. You know it will start transforming people's attitudes and that's like that's the big sort of story here is people are prepared to go on the street and be arrested because we're in a national crisis. And a sort of similar thing sort of happened with Martin Luther King in the 1960s. And he forced it into their faces. And that created this massive conversation, this massive debate, you know, a massive amount of argument, a lot of passion and change. And then by 1968, like, the whole thing has shifted and everyone's going, yeah, you know, like, black people have rights, you know. That's obvious. And so what we need to do is to transform society in the same sort of way. The fundamental sort of aim here is to get the government to talk and talk properly and seriously about the crisis. Extinction Rebellion has three basic demands. The first demand is tell the truth, declare a climate emergency, face this reality together. The second demand is once you've accepted that there's a climate emergency, you've got to act accordingly. And that means Britain needs to go carbon neutral by 2025. And the third demand is our political system, our existing system, has failed to get us moving in the right direction on this. So what we're calling for is citizens' assemblies of ordinary people to come together and talk about how we're going to reach that second demand. How are we going to get to carbon neutral by 2025? We believe that there's huge amounts of wisdom and ideas and possibilities in what ordinary people might be able to think up and do together to reach that eye-watering target. We need people to join us on the streets right now, forget the normal rules, forget the expectation that you're going to have a normal career or a pension or whatever. If we don't get this problem sorted out, 
then if you're a person under about 40 years of old, then that's not gonna be how your life is. I'm terribly sorry to have to say it, but that's the brutal reality that very few people want to face up to. Extinction Rebellion are facing up to that reality. We need everyone's hands on deck and bodies on the line in order to stop these catastrophic possibilities from coming to fruition. It can still be done, just. So what is Extinction Rebellion? It is a peaceful, and I would say loving, non-violent movement for civil disobedience. It is at the heart of everything that we do, whether that be um, an action out on the streets or even communication within the organisation. Um, it's so important that we remain non-violent because through this holding of this, a space of, of, of non-violence and of peace, we are in a so much stronger position. If you want the stats, here we go. It's like 54% of non-violent uprisings like, achieve their objective. 25% uh, of violent ones do. So just on those stats alone, it's a bit of a no-brainer that you should go for non-violence just from a strategic point of view. I never thought I would be an activist. Um, I thought it was for a select group of incredibly inspiring and amazing people throughout history. Um, but activism is simply acting on something you passionately believe in. Um, seeing a problem and acting on the solution. I guess my message really is, you know, we have to all in these times become activists, whether we're lawyers, teachers, scientists, bankers, health workers, you know, council workers, whatever we are, whatever part we have in the economy requires us to stand up and add the word activist to our titles. This is genuinely a movement that welcomes everybody and there is a place for everybody. It's all for one and one for all right now. And what I also love about being in this movement is that we're truly listening. We, we know we have to listen to what people bring, wherever they're from. There's something that we're missing that you will bring. One of the amazing things about Extinction Rebellion is that this is totally decentralized. There are people that have come in last week and are suddenly in control of so much and are doing so much and throwing themselves wholeheartedly into this movement. The point of doing it is to, is to be part of that amazing adventure of life, which is to go out and be truthful and act as if that truth is real. There is no ideology. Uh, there is no political agenda or um, allegiance. There is no, no talk or, or concern for our divisions. We, we know they exist. We know that we have blamed and named and shamed each other through our politics, through our culture, and that that no longer is, is helpful or necessary or, or life-giving. You know, that actually we will destroy um, our futures from those divisions that we've created. So Extinction Rebellion's entire focus is about reweaving the 100%, the whole human family. We need to fundamentally understand that we are part of nature and nature is part of us. And if we destroy nature, we destroy ourselves. And that's the massive social, political and ultimately spiritual lesson that our civilization has to, has to learn. And uh, if we don't, we're dead. I think the most important thing of all is not to trust too much at this point in our history to hope. I think it's something more important than hoping for a good outcome now, and that is finding courage. We need to find the courage to look at this brutal reality of the situation we are in and the much worse reality that is coming down the pike at us. And if we find that courage to look that reality in the face, and if we find community in those people, that increasing number of people who are finding that courage, then we can start to do things that have been as yet undreamt of. And we can achieve something completely extraordinary, something more amazing than Martin Luther King put in train, something more extraordinary than Gandhi or the suffragettes. We can turn around this entire super tanker if we have the courage 
to face what is and the courage then to rise up and do what is necessary to change the course of history. And wouldn't that just be the most fantastic thing to be able to look back on one's life and say, yeah, I was there, I played a part in us effecting that great turning without which we wouldn't even be here now. Let us take a moment, this moment, to consider why we are here. Let's recall our love for the whole of humanity in all corners of the world. Let's remember our love for this beautiful planet that feeds, nourishes and sustains us. Let's recollect our sincere desire to protect all this for ourselves, for all living beings and, and for, for generations, generations to come. come. May we find the courage to bring this sense of peace and appreciation to everyone we encounter. To every word we speak. And to every action we make.